Uh, hi, I'm Richard Belville, and I'm a software engineer at Google on the gRPC team. I am at Nossen on most things, GitHub and Twitter, for example, and today I'm going to talk about a project I've been working on called gRPC Easy. Uh, first, a little bit about myself. I have been working for Google for about a year and a half now, uh, primarily on the Python bindings. Before that, I was working at a smallish networking company called Adtran. I'm glad that I spent time there first because it gave me a ton of perspective. Uh, the thing about small companies is that everyone tends to be less specialized. You have to be generalized in order to cover all of that ground that needs to be covered. So in my time there, I got to help build and maintain a custom messaging framework, as well as build our own container orchestration framework before Kubernetes became the de facto standard, uh, and then migrate to Kubernetes once we saw the writing on the wall. Uh, since Google is such a big company, most people are hyper-focused, which can sometimes lead to myopia. So I'm glad I had my experience in my previous company as a member of the target demographic for gRPC, because I think that's enabled me to empathize with our users a little bit better than I otherwise would have. Okay, so enough about me. Let's talk about gRPC. Although this talk is called gRPC Easy, this is not an introductory talk on gRPC. So I'm not going to be go over, going over all of the basics in detail. If that is what you're looking for, there's another talk at KubeCon that I believe should have aired yesterday called Intro to gRPC by Abhishek Kumar, the tech lead for gRPC at Google. If you're not watching this live, you should probably pause me and go watch that talk or one of the other various intros talks now. Uh, for the benefit of those of you who are watching live, let's do a very brief recap of the structure of an application using gRPC. gRPC is an RPC framework, RPC standing for Remote Procedure Call. When you boil away all the fat, this means that we're a library and a set of development tools that enable you to define and call a function so that it runs on a different machine from the caller. Uh, though it could run on the same machine if you set things up that way. Uh, technically speaking, gRPC is a protocol, not a library. There are many implementations of that protocol. There are, there are the original Go, C++, and Java implementations donated by Google to CNCF, and there are other community source implementations like the one built into Envoy. Uh, but when I talk about gRPC in this presentation, you can safely assume that I'm talking about the original implementations built by Google, since they're the oldest, most robust, and most popular. Uh, so a default gRPC is a point-to-point -point client server model where the client and server can be in different languages, very much like HTTP JSON REST. The difference is in the payload and the different concurrency models you can use. So if you're going to call a function, both the caller and the callee need to know the API and the ABI, the application binary interface. By default, but not as a requirement, gRPC uses protocol buffers for that. So you can see an example of what a protocol buffer service definition looks like here. It looks very similar to how you would define a function in, say, C. So that's what gRPC is. What about its users and how they feel about it? Well, gRPC has found very wide usage in the data centers of big, high-traffic companies. You can see some of them listed on our homepage, gRPC.io. You got uh, Netflix, Cisco, Juniper, Square, and a bunch more. So what do we hear from these users? Uh, well, we hear it's well-supported. You have a preferred language? Odds are we've got bindings and tooling for it. You want to run Windows? We got you. You need to run on ARM? No problem. Uh, we hear that it's performant. At the transport level, we introduce very little overhead. A lot of complex logic has been put in place to ensure maximal performance for multi-threaded applications. And protocol buffers, being a binary serialization format, cut down substantially on the amount of time you would otherwise be serializing and deserializing JSON. If you caught the SIMD JSON project on Hacker News a while back, that was a project that applied some lessons from a protobuf white paper to the task of serializing and deserializing JSON. But because JSON isn't natively a binary format, it's still not as fast. We hear that it's robust. We once got a bug report for a server that crashed after a year of serving. Uh, we fixed the bug, but <laughs> learned that we were down to once a year sorts of bugs in the stack. And they say that it's safe. The interface definition language provided by protobufs helps save you from shooting yourself in the foot by sending an accidentally malformed request to the server. It's like using a statically typed language after being forced to use an untyped language forever. But is it easy to use? I don't think I've ever gotten that sort of feedback before. Uh, very often, the task of migrating these organizations to gRPC lands on the shoulders of a platform team, like an IPC team. Uh, part of the reason for that is that migrating from an existing messaging system can be tricky. Uh, but part of it is likely that using gRPC itself isn't always that easy. Uh, and we sometimes get positive confirmation on that from smaller organizations and individuals struggling to roll out gRPC. 
the gRPC team regularly scours Stack Overflow and answers as many questions as we can. This here is just a sampling of Python related issues that we've seen. Now, it's unavoidable, whatever your project is, that some users are going to have questions about it. But if you want to be inclusive and popular, your goal should be to minimize the level of surprise and of cognitive burden for everyone as much as possible. Uh, when I first started on the gRPC team, I was somewhat uncomfortable with the API and workflow. I'd worked with other tools that were usually to use in the past. And my gold standard was the Python request library. Uh, I'm going to wager that the majority of people watching this talk have used requests, even if Python isn't their daily driver. Why? Well, one, Python is easy. Writing an integration test? Do it in Python. Writing a supporting script? Do it in Python. Working to start up and need to move fast? Hey, it worked for Reddit. Do it in Python. Two, the request library is easy. You can sneeze and accidentally send some JSON to a different continent. Personally, I think this is one of the major reasons why HTTP JSON REST has become so very, very popular. Ubiquitous, user-friendly libraries. So what you're looking at now is the gist that introduced the request library to the world. On the left is what making HTTP GET requests look like before the request library came out of the scene. And on the right is what making an HTTP GET look like after the request library was introduced. Import the library, then do the call. So simple. I always get a kick out of the first comment to this gist. Um, this ultimately was the goal of the gRPC Python library. Lower the barrier to entry so that anyone, no matter what size organization they're a part of, can say, screw it, this one-off server is going to be a gRPC server. We can write it and the client in an hour. So one day, I decided to whine about my issues with the library to a piece of paper. This was eventually transform transformed into a design doc, but at the time, I just called it a complaint doc. There were a lot of little things, but there were really two main friction points that I saw. The first had to do with protocol buffers. I like to lurk around GitHub for people pulling in our library so I can see exactly how they use it. My first observation was that the vast majority of people are not advanced users of the API. The second thing I noticed is that people have absolutely no idea what to do with protocol buffer definition files. So unlike REST, gRPC has a build time step even if you're using an interpretive language like Python or Node. You feed your .proto file, which contains your service definition, you know, your uh, function signature, into the protocol compiler. And it spits out code in your language of choice that you can pull into your client and server code. Now, internal to Google, this is all abstracted away from the user. Uh, there was a paper published in ACM back in 2016 that describes in detail what Google source control, build, and test systems look like called uh, believe why Google stores billions of lines of code in a single repository. Uh, I encourage you to take a look at that afterwards. But in short, Google doesn't scatter its code base across dozens or hundreds of tiny Git repos connected together by package managers, like is fashionable in the open source community these days. Instead, Google's code base is live at head. Every source file lives in a single code base called Google 3. And an internal build system called Blaze tracks every source file and every intermediate target so that the build system is completely hermetic. You can add a printf statement, as deep in your dependency tree as you want, recompile, and just immediately see the results. Uh, the build system is general enough that they created a rule set that allows you to say, I have a .proto file, and I want a library in C++ or Java. And then you can just add a dependency on that library as simply as if you were any, uh, as simple as if you were pulling in a library uh, in your target language. I believe the use case of protocol buffer code gen was actually a driving factor for the crazy generality of Blaze, which, by the way, has relatively recently been open sourced as Basil. So developers in Google don't have to worry about what they do with their generated code. As far as they're concerned, the fact that the code is generated and isn't just a third party library they're pulling in is an implementation detail. But that's not the case for open source users. Out in the open, language agnostic build systems are exceedingly rare. So while there are integrations with Maven and setup tools and various other language specific build systems, you still have to figure out how to integrate with those specialized rules. And then you have to be the one to worry about how you pull down the protocol buffer files from a central source and what to do with the generated code. So what do most people do? The simplest thing, they copy the .proto file. So they have one copy of their client repo and then one copy of their server repo. Okay, now these two have to stay in sync. Every time you or anyone else makes an update to the service definition or to a message definition, they have to remember to update both. Fun. Uh, that's called kinescence if you're looking for the exact software coupling term. Okay, so you've copied your .proto file across multiple repos. Now you struggle with the protocol compiler command line interface. Uh, there are at least three flags that you're gonna have to deal with. One that tells it where to put the generated code for serializing and deserializing messages. One that tells it where to put generated code for clients and servers, uh, 
and one that tells it what directory your protocol buffers live in. If you're doing a Hello World service, this is all in the tutorial on our website. But once you start pulling in multiple .proto files or you have expectations about what language specific module the code should be importable as, you're in for a fun time. So people maybe figure that step out. If not, they probably hand modify the generated code. I've seen that on GitHub a fair few times. Now, when you check in hand modified generated code, uh, the next person that makes an update to the .proto file is in for a nasty surprise. Not only do they have to figure out how to use the protoc protocol compiler, they've got to figure out the hack the previous person added on top of the generated code. Recipe for disaster. So in practice, the people who are successful with protocol buffers tend to store all of their organi organization's .proto files in a single repo and then pull that repo into their client and server repos using Git submodules. Then they integrate code generation into whatever build tool they're using so that developers don't ever have to deal with generated code directly. So that's the first pain point, juggling protos. The second big pain point is channel management. Now, channels are sort of a gRPC specific concept. Generally speaking, gRPC is built on top of HTTP2, which is in turn built on top of TCP. Uh, one of the improvements in the performance of gRPC comes from the fact that you don't spin up and tear down a TCP connection every single time you make a request. A channel represents one or more TCP connections across which our client balances its requests based on load balancing configuration. I actually uh, heard a good joke about this sort of thing once. Um, an HTTP library walks into a bar and orders a beer. It takes the beer and walks out of the bar. One second later, it walks back into the bar and orders another beer, takes it and walks out of the bar, and so on and so forth. Often, HTTP libraries unnecessarily spin up and tear down TCP connections. Uh, some HTTP1 libraries have gotten the message on this and maintained their connections between requests, but it's not universal. So gRPC's current approach is to get the application author to tell us when they're done ordering beers, at which point they close their channel, the TCP connection is shut down, and the memory used to manage the channel is returned to the system. But in practice, we don't see people closing their channels, ever. In fact, we often see servers that need to send downstream requests spin up a new channel for each request they receive. And then they don't ever close those channels. Memory leak. Nasty surprise for them down the road. And we've seen this sort of problem not just with open source users, but with users internal to Google. Uh, we introduced a context manager-based API to combat it, but that just didn't seem to be enough. Even if you do use the context manager version, it adds an extra level of indent, and it isn't very pretty to look at. So with those problems in mind, I tried to create a before and after picture for gRPC Python, just like requests did. Uh, so here's that before and after picture. Uh, on the left, you see the before. Uh, we import the gRPC library and then import our two generated files. Then in the main function, we first construct a stub. We never wrote the symbol greater stub into our .proto file, but we have to use it nonetheless. Uh, honestly, I usually have to look in the generated code to remember what that name should be. Uh, then we construct a protobuf request payload, make an RPC against the local host using the stub, and request a message. And finally, we print out the response. Uh, not a great delivery on the idea of a function called but on another machine. So uh, you see we're using a context manager here to manage the lifetime of our channel. Uh, I know from my GitHub lurking that usage of this form isn't very common. Uh, people generally just create their channel and then don't close it, fire and forget. And of course, we, we have to generate our code using good old Proto C. For Python, we provide the pip installable gRPCIO tools package that bundles Proto C and the gRPC Python plugin. On the right, you can see our attempt at getting closer to the ease of use of requests. We still import gRPC the same way, but now instead of generating code as a build time step, you can import serialization, deserialization, stub and servicer code from a .proto file at runtime. Instead of remembering that there's an underscore pb2 or underscore pb2 gRPC suffix, you just import the .proto file that you've written and chose the name of and is checked into source control. The object you get back is a Python module object, but you can name it whatever you like. In general, I like to call them protos and services. So we create a request message, and then in a single line, we send our message and receive the response. Function you invoke is greeter.sayhello, which is exactly what we wrote in our .proto file. No need to remember arbitrary suffixes or to look them up from the generated code you may have accidentally checked in. Uh, okay. So let's look at things at a little bit more depth. First, there's the runtime.proto file parsing. Uh, what these new functions do is integrate with the Python import lib, import lib module to instantiate modules directly from a .proto file in your Python path. This depends on the presence of the gRPCIO tools package that you've traditionally used at build time. 
that bundles uh, the C extension that does the actual parsing and code gen for protobufs. What's really nice about this is that it, it lowers the barrier to entry for prototyping. Change some fields around in your .proto file, no need to recompile, just restart your client or server. It was also really important to us that you be able to mix together generated code with code loaded directly from a .proto file at runtime. So your runtime parse files can import from .proto files that have already had code generated for them and vice versa. That way, if you prefer, you can use runtime parsing while developing and pre-generate the code when you're ready to put it into production. Alternatively, if you're distributing your application as a wheel, you can now just include your .proto file in the wheel instead of generating Python code from it and including that. Uh, the other big change that we've made is channel pooling. Now, instead of manually creating a channel, then creating a stub from that channel, you can do something that really does just look like calling a function. Of course, this is backed by the same sort of channel that you would have used before. It's just lazily instantiated and kept in a process global cache. Um, after a configurable period of time without any use, channels will be evicted from the cache without any intervention from the author of the application. Uh, this will work for all four arities, not just unary, as is pictured here. And uh, all those arities work exactly as, you, as you'd expect. Uh, the, the new API will exist alongside the uh, current APIs where you manually manage your channels. And you're free to continue to use those whenever you do feel that you need to manually manage those channels. Okay, so now let's run through a slightly more complicated example to see what these new APIs really look like in action. Uh, pretty much every time I give a talk on gRPC, I build out the same example, a uh, key value store, because it's about the simplest non-trivial thing you can build using gRPC. If you wanna see a full in-depth build out of this example, you can just look by name on YouTube. Um, there's one in Go and another in Python. I'm gonna be building up on the Python example and I'm only going to be showing off the client here since the improvements we just talked about over the past couple of slides are really only on the client side. Uh, if you like, you can actually pull down the Go version of the server from the previous talk and test it out against the client code from today's talk. Uh, likewise, the client code will be available on my GitHub. So the key value store we're building is really just a network accessible version of this data structure in Python. Uh, you can store a value under a particular key, you can get a value under a particular key, and you can check whether a particular key exists within the store. It's nothing very fancy. Okay, so this is what our protocol buffer definition looks like. Uh, we've got a record consisting of two strings, a key and a value. Uh, we've got three different kinds of requests to follow best practices for protobuf-based APIs. And then we've got our three methods, get record, create record, and update record. So what does the client code for this look like? Well, short as um, you'd expect. The original version of this client uh, that used the existing APIs was several hundred lines split out over multiple files. Uh, this new client is about 150 lines in total and most of it is actually arg parse. Uh, most of the implementations are a single line to invoke the RPC and then a single line to print the results. You can see one new argument here, which is insecure equals true. This was actually a point of debate when designing these APIs. We wanted to make things as easy as possible, but in 2020, you really don't wanna make anything insecure by default. So the default is actually TLS encryption. And if you wanna do a plain text connection for unit testing, for example, then you have to opt in with this explicit keyword argument. So that's basically the set of new APIs. But while we're on the topic of making gRPC easy, there's already a lot of great stuff in the gRPC ecosystem that I just don't feel is as well known as it should be. Uh, so let's start with gRP curl. Uh, to quote its readme from GitHub, it is a command line tool for gRPC servers. It's basically curl for gRPC servers. I think that says about 80% of it. The really cool thing about this is that if you don't necessarily, is that you don't necessarily need to write the sort of client that we just spent the last few slides looking at. Uh, for simple use cases, you can just write a shell script that uses gRP curl. Uh, gRP curl was written by Joshua Humphreys, who's a developer at Fullstory. He gave a presentation on the tool at GopherCon 2018. So take a look at that if you want more details on it. So here's an example usage of gRP curl to interact with the key value store we just talked about. There's a plain, tag, uh, plain text flag here because again, insecure by default, bad. Uh, there's the payload, which is defined in JSON here. There's the server target and there's the fully qualified method that we want to invoke. Boom, out comes a record. But there's a catch. Uh, we supplied JSON. How did gRP curl know how to serialize that to the binary form? It doesn't have access to the protocol buffer definitions. We didn't tell it where they were. 
Well, the secret actually lies on the server. The server I ran this against exported a reflection server. What does that mean? There's a gRPC service definition that allows a server to tell interested clients exactly what methods it has and what the in messages and out messages look like. So when we ran gRP curl here, what happened was the gRP curl process first ran a query against the reflection server at the target we specified. It used the information it learned to serialize our JSON into a protobuf serialized format. The catch is that you have to choose to export a reflection server on your target. It's really easy in all languages, just a couple of lines of code, but it's an opt-in process. And there are certain instances in which you may not want to for security reasons, for example. But reflection is actually even cooler than this. What it really gives you more than anything else is discoverability. Without looking at documentation, you can ask GRP curl to tell you the exact schema that any given server expects. Uh, the verbs that you want to use for this are list and describe. They allow you to explore an API. Of course, you also could have just supplied GRP curl with the path of the protos on your file system, and then it wouldn't have needed to query the reflection server. So that is as far as tips and tricks for making gRPC easy goes. But I'd like you to know that we're absolutely receptive to contributions and suggestions to do with usability. So if you have an idea or even just a complaint, please provide us with more feedback. Uh, one of the hardest things about maintaining an open source project is that more often than not, when something is broken or difficult to use, we never hear from that user. They just drop the library. So we definitely do value the feedback when we hear from our existing or potential users. Uh, the two places that you would want to give that feedback are uh, one of the several GitHub repos that has our implementation or the gRPC-IO Google group, which is where we sort of uh, conduct official business like API extension proposals or just answer questions. And um, the APIs that you saw here today should be available in the next release of gRPC. Uh, if you want to try them out before then, you can just pull from our nightly builds. So with that, I think we can move on to questions. Hi there, everybody. Uh, glad to see you all live now. Uh, I think we're going to go ahead and get started with questions. Uh, so please forgive uh, me if I mispronounce any of, of your names. I'm sorry about that. Uh, first one I see is from Deepak, any provision to generate UML model from Proto. Um, it's possible that such a tool exists within the community ecosystem. Uh, I haven't seen one. If you did want to build one, I don't think it would actually be very difficult. Um, the protocol compiler has a system of plugins that uh, can just be binaries on the file system. There's an environment variable that allows you to tell the protocol compiler where to look for those. Uh, and it's a very simple format where it takes uh, a serialized protocol buffer message on standard in and it outputs code on standard out. Um, and so you could, for example, take in uh, an arbitrary protocol buffer and output uh, a UML file in any format that you'd like. Um, so Chandra asks, when would you use gRPC rather than when you when would you not use gRPC? Um, so let's start with reasons why you might not want to use gRPC in any particular circumstance. Um, so let's say that you know you're in a setup where uh, you don't necessarily have full support for HTTP, HTTP2 on your data path. Right? There might be some uh, L, L7 proxies that aren't going to support it fully. Um, there might be some network elements that aren't going to support everything. You might be running in a browser that doesn't support trailers, which is most of them at the moment. I will say for uh, a caveat, there is gRPC web, which allows you to get most, but not all of the functionality of gRPC and requires a proxy in the middle. So those are circumstances where you might choose not to use gRPC. Uh, I did give you a bunch of pros at the beginning of uh, this talk of gRPC. Um, like type safety, for example. Um, the, the other big area where you're going to want to use gRPC is where you need streaming or you're, you have very, um, you have a lot of sensitivity to latency, right? So in an event driven model, you don't want the clients to be polling because polls always have um, a, a cool down between each poll. What you want is for the server that sources the events to push them to the client. That's when gRPC streaming is going to be incredibly valuable to you. Uh, on to the next one, uh, Deepak asks, does protobuf support inheritance and composition? Uh, this is a really good question. So uh, composition, very basic uh, feature of protobufs. You can arbitrarily nest message types inside of each other. Um, 
and that's going to allow you to do composition. As for inheritance, there isn't inheritance as you know it from languages like Java, C++, but there um, is a feature called extensions, which allow a message to say that they are reserving uh, certain field numbers for a third party usage, which means that an application that uses any particular message is able to add their own fields defined by their file uh, with, within those extensions. Um, so that's, that's some, something akin to inheritance. Chandra asks, when there's a simple client server architecture, would you still recommend gRPC versus normal REST? Absolutely. Um, the other thing that I, I will say there is um, people sort of build this false dichotomy between gRPC and REST. Um, REST technically is um, a set of semantics for how you build your APIs and you can build a RESTful gRPC service. It just means that you need your RPCs to be resource oriented. Um, I think maybe what you're asking here is about um, HTTP JSON REST, which is sort of people allied it to REST these days. Um, but in general, I would say, yeah, uh, you can use gRPC in any place where you use REST plus other areas. Um, Christian asks, what about using Golang for gRPC slash proto? Is there also a way to directly make use of the dot proto files? If yes, how is code completion handled then in IDEs? If no, what do you recommend here? Check in generated code. Okay, so uh, I think you've uh, keyed into something crucial, which is um, for, comp for compiled languages, this scheme where we load from dot proto files at runtime does not work the same way. The reason that it works in Python and Node and could potentially work in PHP and Ruby is because when you uh, say foo.bar, you know, you access a bar member of a variable foo in those languages, you're literally doing a dictionary lookup, right? You're looking up that symbol bar at runtime. That's not what's happening in the compiled languages. In the compiled languages, they see at compile time that I'm looking for this member bar and that it translates it to sort of an offset or some other uh, mechanical lookup from uh, the, the serialized protocol buffer message. Uh, so you need those protocol buffer uh, header files or .go files at compile time. Um, you could in principle do something similar, but the way that you would access the protos, uh, individual members of a pro protocol buffer message would be very different and not quite as idiomatic. So that's the first part of the question. You could in principle do it, I wouldn't recommend it. Uh, the other question was, if no, what do you recommend here? Check in generated code? Uh, I would still say, try your very best not to check in generated code. There are a couple things you can do here. Uh, the first one is going to be, um, I mentioned that internally to Google, uh, a build system called Blaze is used. That's been open sourced as a system called Basil. Um, I actually think that uh, the Go toolchain was inspired by a lot of the, the um, features in Blaze. Uh, you could just use Basil. I've seen a lot of uh, Golang projects using Basil. If you don't want to use that, if you want to use the vanilla Golang toolchain, uh, there is a go generate command that might meet your needs. Uh, in general, I think best practice is to include your generated files in your git ignore file if you're using git. Uh, Bart, Bart Smith asks, is using the proto files from runtime also available in Java? Uh, no, not to my knowledge, but with the same caveat as in the previous answer, that you could in principle use uh, reflection APIs to read from a .proto file at runtime. But again, since at compile time, you don't have access to um, the, the symbols that you would need to access things, it wouldn't look like idiomatic Java in order to access an individual uh, member bar of a message foo. Uh, Namit asks, although it is making it a lot easier for the client, but still the client needs to understand that is working with the gRPC server. Is there a way that we can completely abstract this? Not sure I, I fully understand the question. Um, okay, so yes, uh, if we're talking about differences between um, uh, a client and uh, between an actual local function call and um, one against a gRPC server, there is in addition to the arguments, there's also the target server, the location of the target server. Uh, and there are things like transport level security. Um, so one thing that I already called out, the transport level security, 
you could make that, uh, uh, you could include SSL credentials. And by default, uh, it will use SSL credentials if you don't supply anything there. Um, the other thing is the server target, right? So how can you abstract that away? Um, there, it, it's not exactly um, completely abstracted away, but um, there is a lot of work going into the set of XDS protocols, which mean that you can abstract away the address of a particular server that you're going to, and you can use a control plane like Istio or uh, Traffic Director on GCP that allow you to abstract out to an abstract service name that doesn't correspond to a particular server's IP or host name. Um, and those can change dynamically. Uh, that would help to abstract that away a little bit. I don't know if that fully answers your question though. Uh, Alex asks, any plans to add more officially supported languages in the future? Um, so I'm, I'm, a, I'm wondering if this is about gRPC in general or if this is about um, the features that I discussed here today. I'm assuming that this is about general language support. Um, no, I do not know of uh, plans for additional languages, but um, they're popping up in the community all the time. Uh, for example, Kotlin support recently came around. I know of multiple uh, Rust implementations that have been coming around. If you keep your eyes peeled, you will see lots of other languages coming around. Um, and if you have any language that you care about in particular, it's not too difficult to uh, wrap the gRPC core, which is, um, which is, it used to be a plain uh, C89 set of APIs that you can wrap a higher level API around. Now it's um, C++, but there it is a relatively stable set of APIs. So you could in principle build a new language around that relatively easily. Um, and those are all of the questions I see right now. Um, so I am going to head over to the Slack and I'll be available there for at least the next 15 minutes. Uh, thank you, everybody, for attending today, uh, and I think that'll be it for the talk. Thank you.